please, if we might. Uh, and just for the record, Commissioner Justice is a little under the weather today, but he is going to be watching us. He will not be participating. Hi, Charlie. And uh, Commissioner Seals running just a few minutes late, but she will be joining us. So without further ado, do we, I guess we need to do the roll. We're all here, minus one. Okay, we're good. Uh, uh, Mr. Burton, do you want to lead us off with the utilities? Certainly. Um, so this morning, the first item on the agenda is our utilities department, and they've embarked on a study to assess the uh, their user fees. Um, so staff's going to be presenting the findings of that study uh, with their consultant, Stantec. So um, up today is Hillary Weber, our deputy director of utilities, and Stantec's uh, senior manager, De uh, Jeff Dystra. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Hillary Weber, utilities director, or deputy director for Pinellas County. Today we are presenting an overview of our utilities user fee studies. The anticipated implementation of these user fees will be in fiscal year 23. So to set the stage for today's presentation, the focus will be on user fees, which are charges that cover the cost of providing various utility services. Examples of these charges include fees for installing new meters at new developments, connecting to sewer service for the first time, and customer deposits for new account setups. This study also looked at our latest user fees, which were last assessed in 2010, and compared them to regional and industry benchmarks to ensure we are being consistent with our regional partners. As a utility, it's important for user fees to be evaluated periodically to ensure they are aligned with our cost of service as the cost of materials and labor continue to fluctuate over time. For this evaluation, the utilities department obtained consulting services with Stantec, who performed the user fee study and completed the evaluation. At this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Jeff Dykstra, Senior Manager with Stantec, to present an overview of their comprehensive study on Pinellas County Utilities user fees, along with some recommended updates. Good morning. Good morning, Commission. Good morning. Uh, Jeff Dykstra with Stantec. Try to move this. Um, so I'm pleased to be with you this morning. I know user fees is, utility user fees are everybody's favorite subject, right? So, um, but it's an important part for the utility. It's an important, important revenue component for the utility for a couple of reasons. Not only does it provide revenues, but it also um, allows the utility to uh, recover the cost of supplemental services that they provide. Um, from specific customers, and so there's an equity component to user fees as well. Uh, the user fees, as Hillary described, are generally speaking uh, specific services, if you think of outside of the scope of the, the general services that the utility provides, and that's the you know, provision of potable water to the, to the homes and businesses, um, and the collection and treatment of wastewater, and well as, well as reclaim water. Those are kind of the core services that the utility provides. Um, in addition to that, though, the utility does provide separate services like um, you know, meter testing, uh, account turn-ons when new customers come onto the system, new connection fees as well. So these are the types of fees that we're talking about today. They represent a small portion of the utility's overall revenues, but as I, as I stated, it's important to make sure that the fees are aligned with the costs. Um, because to the, effect of, to the effect that they're not, um, essentially the, the rest of the ratepayers um, of the system will, will cover the difference there. Most, or, or I should say many of the user fees were last updated for the utility back in 2010, uh, but there are some that have, haven't been updated in 15 plus years and even decades in other cases. Um, an important takeaway from our study though is just to you know, iterate at the outset that the results of our study and the proposed fees will not um, increase monthly service charges for 70% uh, of the residential customers. And so these are really for sp specific services from uh, a customer requiring or requesting the service. In the process of the, doing the study, we, we've organized the fees into four categories, and I'll cover them in my presentation here as we go through. The first category of the user fees that we looked at is the, the customer deposits. 
These are a deposit made by a, a customer establishing service or establishing a new account with the utility. Uh, very common within the industry. Uh, they provide the ability, the, the utility, the ability to minimize their risk of non-payment on a customer they don't have any history with. Um, and so a couple of key takeaways from the customer deposits. These were last evaluated about 12 years ago. And two, two important takeaways I want to leave with you is um, they can be waived, or they are waived according to the, the utility's policies with a good payment history. Um, and then they're also refundable. So assuming over a period of time that the account remains in good standing, these deposits are, are uh, refundable. The second category of the user fees are what we call miscellaneous fees, and these are those one-time services. So that turn on, uh, turn on uh, service fee that I mentioned, that's a good example of a miscellaneous fee. During the study, we updated the utilities nearly 100 of these fees uh, according to their current, the utility's current process to perform the activity as well as the current cost. Uh, some fees have gone up with the proposed, the propo proposed fees are going up and some are going down but now they align with the utility's actual cost to provide the service. During the study, staff also identified about a dozen uh, activities or services that the utility is currently providing, but there's not an established fee for. And so we also did the cost analysis on these and, and they're presented here on the screen. Um, but these are important because their services provided but not being charged for. And so as of this time, um, if that fee isn't assigned to the customer requiring or requesting the service, um, the rest of the ratepayers have to pick up the slack. And so that's why it's important to establish these user fees. The third category of user fees is what, I, what I'm terming as recurring user charges. And so these are, um, instead of those one-time type services, these are more recurring in nature where the utility is continually providing the service. And there's four of them that I'll cover today. Uh, the first is a backflow prevention device. This is a um, device typically associated with a customer who has reclaimed water service. And it's important because it protects the potable water supply from being, um, you know, interacting or mixing with reclaimed water for that customer. So there's a water quality component to that, to that device and it needs to be maintained regularly and replaced periodically. Uh, this is one fee that will impact about 30% of your residential customers. And you can see that arrow on the slide, we've drawn attention to it um, that just to highlight that. But about 30% of your overall residential customers would see an increase um, on, their buy, on their monthly utility cost of, of about seven, of 78 cents uh, per month. So I do want to point that out. The second uh, recurring charge we looked at that the utility has is um, called a standby, annual standby service for fire protection. These are private fire lines uh, that Usually you're associated with businesses or commercial properties, uh, but they have their, their own private fire lines. But the utility is providing uh, the capacity to, to serve that property in the event of a fire. And so this is a standby charge for that. Hopefully it's not used, um, or the service isn't used, but they're paying for that availability. And this is an annual fee that affects less than 1% of the utility's overall customers, I'll point out. Um, and with the updated fees, they would see increases of usually between 1% and 3% on their, um, on their bills. The third recurring charge we looked at is the um, wholesale monthly meter service charge. Uh, this is a charge that's fixed per month, and it's associated only with your wholesale water customers. You can see uh, there's about 23 um, wholesale meters in service right now for, um, for water. And this, this fee recovers the utility's cost to maintain the meter, uh, to read it and to do billing and, and accounting support specifically for the wholesale customers. Um, because they're wholesale customers with large meters, they're using a lot of water or purchasing a lot of water from the county, um, the incre any increases you see there on the table um, aren't likely to you know, impact the, the overall bill on a percentage basis materially. And then the last recurring uh, user fee that the utility has, we updated as well the high strength wastewater surcharge. This is a fee outlined in the city or the county's um, sewer ordinance. And it's part of the industrial pretreatment program that um, has certain requirements for um, industries that have uh, concentrated wastewater discharges into your system. In, in simple terms, these are 
you know, industries because of the processes that they're going through um, cause, you know, if you will, more polluted or contaminated wastewater to enter your system, and it has a cost to it. And so these fees are, are applied to, um, in your case, you have three industrial customers that participate in the program. And um, if you look at the table, you'll see the parameters there. Uh, those are technical terms, but essentially you can think of those as measurements of the contaminants or pollutants. And so um, biological oxygen demand and total suspended solids are, are what those parameters are in your program. What we're recommending as part of the study this year, or as part of this analysis, is to um, adjust the methodology to be more in line with the industry, and that is a unit charge per pound of these parameters, as you see there. Um, this allows a more direct correlation between the cost to provide the service and also allows you to charge uh, a customer in instances where maybe on one parameter or, or both parameters where they're exceeding the limit as opposed to the current approach, which just captures the maximum. So all that being said, you can see the estimated impact on the customers on the graph on the right. Um, and you have, as I said, you have three customers that participate in this program right now. And the final category of user fees that we updated and evaluated is the capacity fees. Uh, you'll hear this terminology, or different terms for these fees throughout the industry, but essentially they all come back to the, the simple purpose of um, new capacity costs for new development, so growth pays for growth. As your system takes on new customers, there may be the need to expand facilities, um, treatment plant capacity, transmission system capacity, and so these fees allow the development to pay their fair share of those costs. In your case, these fees haven't been updated in about 40 years. Excuse me, did you say 4-0? 4-0, yes. <laughs> and so that when you look at this graph, uh, you'll notice the cost in that light blue color for water compared to the current, which is on the far left. You'll see a pretty substantial difference between the current and the cost for both water and sewer. Um, but what we have done as part of this is recommending, we're recommending a four-year phased-in approach that's in line with the Florida Impact Fee Act. Um, in, in 2021, um, the legislature updated the Impact Fee Act to minimize the amount of impact fee increases um, that, that a um, utility can, can implement, and they limit that to 50%, and an increase of that magnitude has to be phased in over four years. And so that's what we're proposing and recommending here today. With impact or capacity fees, you, you often, um, the utilities that we work with always want to see how do we compare it to our you know, regional uh, providers. And so uh, we, this graph depicts that, shows your existing fees, and even with the four-year phase-in plan, you would maintain your position relative to other communities and counties in the area. And what, what's of note of this on this graph is usually the, the counties or communities that have updated these fees recent, more recently are towards the top. <laughs> And um, you also you also notice that they have more growth than some of the others, and so that's just a natural thing that happens um, with these types of fees. But it just provides some interesting perspective. And in conclusion, um, after looking at and updating the utilities over 200 fees in total, um, our recommendations are that. The proposed fees get adopted as part of the 2023 budget approval process, and the user fees would be effective October 1st, with the exception of the, the capacity fees, which we just talked about. Those have a special 90-day public notice period, and so the recommendation is that those would be implemented effective January 1 of next year. And with that, I'm certainly uh, happy to answer any questions, and I know I give you a lot of information to digest, but um, certainly willing to open up for discussion if need be. Madam Chair. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, uh, appreciate the, um, the update. It seems to me like um, I love using percentages when they're small and dollars when they're big. I mean, when, so, so you see increases in sewer, I mean, the proposed is to go from a, on, on, this is on page three, from 115 to $180. And again, um, you know, you're talking 60% increase. 
Um, and and I, I like the phased approach that you talked about later in the presentation, but I think there's, to me, there's room for that here as well. I mean, if we've waited 12 years to be adjusting, we've obviously not been meeting costs along the way already. And I think that's, I mean, 100 to $110, I guess, 10 percent still a large increase, but if we're trying to play catch up, the other one, the sewer seems large, uh, just as an example. Um, and then, um, let me just add a couple. Um, are are couple. you most concerned about the um, the five eighths and three quarter, which is most of your residential yeah, customers? Yeah, I mean that, that's the one that jumps out at me. Obviously, yeah. the others do a little bit as well, but the, the residential component is the the one that that concerns me. The large percentage increase yeah. concerns me on all of them, but that, that's that's a big one. Um, okay. And and. Um, and then, and then I just really wanted to go to, um, like, I don't know. I just want to make sure I understand what all of these are to a resident. Sure. So if we go to, like, page four and you talk about miscellaneous fees, you've got a turn-on fee. I'm saying I'm a, a resident. I come to, into my house and I want to turn the – It's that's what that is when you yeah, turn so service on and then turn – but you have a, a you want to do it the same day it's even a special charge mm -hmm. so they're not out and about anyway that they could just do it without having to have a special charge but whatever i don't understand that operation so um uh and then permit fees you know again almost a, a almost a hundred percent increase um and, and then moving into miscellaneous fees on on page Five um, remo <coughs> uh, removal of meter and water. I, I you know, again, I, I, you're talking about a resident that is coming off. So, so, so you you charge them when they turn it on. You charge them when they turn so it this off. This is yeah. That that fee in particular is a, a physical removal of the meter and this and the connection. So a, a turn on would be you're leaving the the equipment there. You're just, making the service not available. So this is an add-on cost to like a new home. And this is the actual removal. The uh, There is an existing fee that would capture um, if, if it's a home a new without one. priors. A new, a new home, it would be. You already have a fee for that, yeah. There's always already a fee yeah. for that. And then if you remove the meter, that's. That, that's yeah, and I, I have to defer to staff, but I, I'm remembering from our conversations that um, this was one that had come up in a certain few certain circumstances, the removal. And so we had, um, they had recommended that this was one that they had seen enough of that they were having to exert effort to come out into the field and actually do meter removal. Okay, so, so, so normally the meter stays. Exactly. Yep. And you just switch names and have a meter exactly. reading and that's it. So this exactly. is, I don't know what this is. So this is. This is the process of taking the, the meter yeah, out of. I know for what, what purpose? I just don't understand. What, what? So one, one example yeah. um, is if someone requested, if they have two lots and they want to consolidate into one lot, you have two meters, and this is something that the customer would request, then staff are deployed to the field, and then they, are, they remove the additional meter connection. So it wouldn't come up very often. It does not happen very frequently. Usually it's the other way around where you see the one lot and they want to make it two. Well, I, I, don't want, I know there's others that have questions, and I'm, I'm going to have some others here in a little bit, but I just think we need to think about that phasing process. It's on us for not addressing them sooner, mm -hmm. and I hate to do too much at once. So if we, the four-year phase in on one thing I think is applicable to some other areas as well, but I'll listen to what my colleagues have to say. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the... Uh presentation, it's very understandable. A couple of questions. Well, my first is a comment. Um, I know that we want to hold to what the current policy says um, as it relates to phasing in. My concern is, is that we're already looking at, in some cases, 40 plus years of um, revenue that could have been, um, or charges that could have been applicable that have not been. So if we're going to phase it in over four years, in four years time, we're going to potentially see a continued increase, possibly, in the things that we're doing. Is um, you know, I'm glad that we are uh, putting in, if we have not already begun installing the new meters, 
that should help a lot, especially helping the customer, you know, detect leaks and things like that earlier. But I am concerned about the four-year phase in, um, and then in that four-year period of time, having costs increase, and so then you're you're doing another lump on top, especially with what all is going on now, which we have no control over. So just sharing that part. Um, I um, and this is just based on a question that Commissioner Eggers just asked. I do know that. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, you have pe people who do not pay their water bills and they have ways of turning it back on. So the meter then is actually removed so that they can't go in and continue to do that. But then you also have persons who may have a one dwelling that um, is expanded, so they need a larger meter. So you have to go in <clears throat> and do a pull out and switch out in order to accommodate that. So I, I do understand where you're, you're coming from in that. Um, for un under um, um, on the slide with customer deposits, which is I guess like the third slide, um, it's calling me. It's like the third slide um, where you have this on the sewer side. Um, there's like an eight hundred and sixty-five dollar difference um, for the two inch, I guess two inch pipes on that. Um, I guess this would be a question for staff. I know that we had a presentation the other week about trying to increase the longevity of our sewer system by using institute form or lining those pipes um, for longevity in that. Um, but what about, um, what about the other sewer costs that we're experiencing? I know we're doing some upgrades on our plants to try to handle more uh, waste <laughs> um, and how we convert that waste into pellets and then resell it. But um, I guess I'm just a little worried about just kind of what's all going on now and the largest amount of increase is on that side. So the Address. This is just deposit. This is just a hold for um, someone that doesn't have a history with us, um, and so it's just a deposit. And this would be for a so pretty. So this is for someone who doesn't already have a history, but they're correct. And so we have a deposit. They can. They can. If, but it's also for two inch. This would be a business. This would be a pretty large business. Correct. Um, it. These deposits can also be waived with good standing and a letter from the previous utility. Um, so there is that option. And um, after a period of two years, I believe, uh, for residential, um, the deposit is refunded back to the customer as long as it's in good standing. Do we refer deposits back if it's a business, a larger business, or it's just for residential? At the time of the account closure, you, they would get the deposit back, yeah. And if a person is not in good standing, do we increase the deposit? Well, the deposit goes towards any, effectively, any outstanding balance that they would have. Um, I'm asking that because I know Duke Energy, if you're late so many times on your bill or whatever, you'll get not only your late notice, but you get the notice that says you could potentially experience an increase in your deposit because of the quote unquote risk you are now exhibiting by not paying your bills timely. So that's what I'm asking if we. But so, so you can kind of get a feel, Hiller, if you, or you get in, either one can you address this. I mean, a, a two inch is not a small business. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good sized business. Maybe you can address the different oh, yeah. categories of who's, you know, yeah. most of it is five eighths or three quarter inch yeah. service. Yeah, so that's a great point. So, and, and I'll give you a little bit of background on how the deposits are determined here. Um, so we don't just say, hey, we think the deposit should go up, you know, whatever the number is, there's what, what we're actually doing here is calculating <laughs> deposits within the industry are generally calculated based on a, um, a one to three month billing period. So what is the bill for that time period? And so that's how this is determined. We're using one billing cycle, which for the county is two months, and adding on a, basically a 35 day collection period to basically say, here's what the cost is for the utility to provide the services that the, that the customer would have for almost 100 days. Um, and that's how these calculations are determined by meter size. So to, to the administrator's point, the larger the meter size, the more volume of water they're typically using. And so that's why you see these um, deposits higher for the higher meter size, because that reflects their bills. So. And did you all have a chance to determine um, the dollar value uh, of revenue that this would generate? So on the deposits, um, we did. Um, but again, it's, it, it's held in 
in an account right. and return right. to them. And I could, we could provide that for you. I don't have it offhand. But yeah, the, I understand it's the miscellaneous fees in general. All of the things that we talked about today um, have about uh, just over a million dollar impact on an annual basis to the utility. Um, just to provide some perspective, not including the deposits. And the reason I'm asking is because when you start talking about an increase in a dollar value for services, um, sometimes the public doesn't necessarily hear the explanation that you just provided, that those dollars have to sit, quote unquote, in a reserve area so that if you're refunding that money back, you're pulling that money essentially from where the money originated from. All they see is there's an increase in services, you know, why can't you put that back into um, what you all are charging so you can help bring down the cost? So that's why I asked that. And that's actually, you're, you're alluding to really a great, a great point. One of, the per, one of the purposes of the utilities user fees is because they're for activities assigned with specific activities from that customer. And so if those fees aren't charged, the rest of the rate payers effectively are picking up the difference. And so that's, there's an equity component to that too, that, you know, if, if I'm a customer and I'm, requesting a service to happen, and I'm not getting charged for it, that means that I'm paying for it, you're paying for it, neighbor's paying for it. Every, every rate payer in the system is, is basically picking up that, uh, that fee that wasn't paid by that customer. So, yep. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any questions? Anybody? Hello? Nobody? Okay. So if um, what we'll do is we'll... Um, take under advice on what you, what you just said and we'll come back to you as part of the budget process with a recommendation on um, how to go forward. Obviously, we've about aligned it with the budget. Um, on that one component piece, we'd have to do a 90-day notification period, and so we'll have to get some guidance as part of the budget process to know how, how to set that up and when. That's the reason it wouldn't begin until January 1st. Um, but we'll discuss whether we can phase some of those in or not. The, the one thing we're trying to do with all of our fees is, as you guys um, asked us to do is to keep them up to date to where we don't come back and have a large increase and we, and we keep them keep them current to where it's 1% or 2%, not, you know, needing to double because we haven't looked at them in 20 years. Um, so this is part of that process. So if, if I may, Barry, and there's no other questions from my colleagues, uh, I would appreciate, I think it would be helpful as well when you come back for the budget presentations to have uh, some kind of an idea about let's pretend we put all of the recommendations in place the way they are here then what is that amount of revenue that you think will, it will generate and kind of project out given that we are talking about doing it in phases where your projections I don't know if this is possible but what does that look like at the end of that four years in terms, I mean, I know we can't control what's going on around, around us and the economy and all of that, but I think in trying to keep up once we, I mean, the idea is to get us to a place where we can kind of reset, right, and not have to keep falling behind and further and further behind. I found the slide, um, like it's slide number 12, the comparisons um, between our neighboring counties and us, that's pretty startling to see the difference there. And the other thing, I, I don't want to take up time this morning necessarily, but that I question or don't understand, or maybe it's because I've never served on Tampa Bay water, but it looks like some of our municipalities are already I mean, they're paying less. I, I'm really not sure how to read that right there, but it looks, did they have a large decrease in the fees that they're paying, or am I just looking at this wrong? I know it's the slide. Oh, with if, water if you're looking at the water. capacity fees, so, yeah. the, so the capacity fees is, is um, like a connection, you know, fee, okay? And, and so you can see that. And so you got, where you got high growth counties, they're running lines out, they're investing more in their infrastructure. That's going to be, um, it's going to be more expensive because they're recapturing their cost. You know, yeah, and St. Pete, for example, St. Petersburg, they don't have a water uh, capacity fee, so that's why they're, um, you don't see a blue bar on that graph. But um, some of them, like them, they subsidize that through their own property tax. So you got to look at the rate structure for the individual uh, municipality and how the rate structure is set up. And frankly, some of those uh, municipalities also have an updated 
I'm sorry? Yeah. Some of those municipalities have an updated impact fees recently well. there as well. you go. So, that's so we're all in the same boat. No, yeah. yeah, on the lower end of that, that graph, yes, that's typically the case. Um, the ones that have updated them, you'll see are on the top um, and are higher. But we can, you know, we can look at it again. It, the, this is not just for the public's purpose to reiterate that this is not your standard sewer and water bill. These are individual fees associated with individual activities, um, and it, it re represents just two percent of the overall revenue of um, the utilities department. So, I think it's important how we message all of that because it's a bit complicated, quite frankly, and when you lay on top of that our water reserves and where our water comes from and how not only in our region but throughout the country water is becoming more and more and more of a limited resource and i think that this is an issue that going forward we're going to have to pay some serious attention to we'll look at it bring it back to you and guess what budget's just around the, the corner, corner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah. Yeah, did, Thank you very much. You did ask a question, if I could, just about the um, the revenues. Um, the I, the, rep, the total totality of all the proposed user fees represents about 1.1 million or so estimated revenues per year, um, additional for the for the utility. Additional. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just one quick question. Madam yes, Chair. Commissioner. Rangel. Yeah, just um, yeah, so so I think the idea, Barry, that we talked about getting the fees and kind of keeping up with them is a good yeah. idea. And so just that little. Where we where we're, we we've been 14 years or 12 years or whatever it is, just to step into it a little bit. And again, I think people today, you know, struggling to make ends meet, new homeowners trying to, you know, and then you tell them, well, you're you're going to have $300 for water and sewer deposit. I mean, it's just <laughs> versus 200. Well, it's, mo it's, it, most residential, it's going to be the 180. Okay, not that for water because, and sewer. Yeah, it's, well, for, actually, I, for water I, and sewer, it's about three hundred. Yeah, okay. It, so. Versus two hundred. So I right. mean, it's just a it's a sizable number. It's just so if, again, yes. if we can kind of step into it a little bit and get caught up, I think that would be yes. helpful. So and so, uh, so we'll we'll look at that and, and come back to you with a recommendation. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay, and uh, next on our agenda is Wait. our tourism update. That's our it's, tourism update, and we have yep. Steve Hayes. Here. Correct. I see him way in the back over there. Okay, okay. and come on I, up. I Steve. think he's going to start, and then Barbara is going to has a component piece to this. So good. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right. All right. I want to go through this morning and and provide a brief update related to three different things. One, just a general tourism update and what is happening. Two, to give you some ideas of uh, some data-driven studies that we've completed. And then last, to talk about a recent campaign that we had this spring, um, all, um, all around being unwind and, and be kind. When we go and look at the general tourism update, and the first, the first statement up there is, how do we do this spring? Um, if you go through and, and look at a number of different metrics, um, I was very successful. And I say spring that January through that um, probably middle part of the, of the April. When we look at our audience, interestingly enough, compared to, to previous quarters, um, us, us boomers were more of an audience than the millennials, which was a change that, that we saw. Our uh, household income was flat, the spend was flat, the uh, overnight visitors went up considerably, and our party size actually went down. So what that meant was we had less people visiting, but they were going through and, and staying um, longer. When we go through and look at the um, metrics related to our lodging industry, and that's going to be on the um, occupancy ADR, average daily rate, and revenue per available room. Um, some interesting notes here. Um, on, on that, um, our rate has increased, but our occupancy has been flat, especially for the month of March. Now we're making a year-to-year -year comparison to 21, which is when everything started uh, coming back. What is even more interesting is when I go and look at calendar year 21, I look at the top 25 MSAs in the United States. 
So Chicago, New York, Boston, D.C., Orlando, Miami, just think of the, the top 25. Pinellas County was first in occupancy for the calendar year. We were fourth in average daily rate, and we were third in revenue per available room. Continue that on into the month of March, and this is March of 22, we were second in occupancy, second in ADR, and second in, in RevPAR. So again, at the, at the top of the list, in fact, on the ADR and the RevPAR, um, pretty much who beat us every time was Miami. Uh, and we, we were falling second there. And then in April, we were seventh in occupancy, but fourth in ADR and fourth in RevPAR. And I wanted to bring those numbers up because that also then goes back to reflect on the TDT collections. So we look at the month of March, which is the latest collections that we have, and we were just shy of, of 13 million. So we don't have any of that. Is there, can you provide that to us, what you're? Yes, and, 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 I, and I was trying to be short on this um, and, then, and then give you guys a link to the actual data that, that we have. That way you could re go through and read that at, at your um, leisure. Okay. Um, but on the, on the TDT collections? On the TDT collections, just shy of 13 million compared to 9.7 million last March, year to date at 47 compared to just shy of 30 million uh, in March of the previous year. So that's why I wanted to bring up the occupancy and ADR because it was a combination of both things at the, in parts of the fiscal year, but then occupancy has flattened out and, and rate has, has stayed high. As we look forward, now, and I, and I say forward, going forward now, um, and this, uh, our uh, research company, Destination Analyst, went through and did a survey of 4,000 Americans in April of 22. So this is looking across the United States. Here were some observations. 59% uh, of American travelers believe that it's likely an economic recession will begin this year, and 28% believe inflation will weaken this year. So a little bit of a dichotomy there. 65% of American travelers feel it's likely tourism businesses will continue to have problems finding employees. So think hotels, airlines, restaurants, other types of businesses. And I really look to the airline market as, as a, a huge impact. Um, and I, I know I've heard uh, some things from the airlines where they are cutting back schedules because they don't have the pilots in order to carry out the schedules. And Florida is such an integral part of the airline network. Think about who we have at Pi, think who we have at Tampa International, and how that will potentially affect travel. 58% of American travelers agree that if the gasoline prices don't come down, they'll be taking fewer road trips this summer. And they also say that they'll be staying closer to home. On that note, if we start to see that happen, then we will pivot and start to bring things closer in. Um, when I say closer in, in the state of Florida, within the, re the region itself. However, if we don't see a change there, we'll still keep our messaging out in, into the southeast and some of our key uh, uh, northeast markets. Um, the, the good news is that 82% of American travelers are excited about traveling for leisure in the next 12 months, and that's at near record levels uh, that, we, that we saw just coming out of the pandemic. So there's still excitement to travel as you just got some things that may impact what, what happens from there. So again, we will watch it closely, uh, talking to a destination analyst, our research company, to make sure that we're not missing opportunities, that we're not going through and, and, and missing business. Um, uh, that, that's out there. They did address international travel a little bit, um, and the good news on there is internationally we expect to see that to come back. Uh, we're starting to see that already with our European travelers, um, but in Canada specifically, we expect to see that rise up in the fall, which would really be good because, again, that's an important audience for us um, when we go through and uh, uh, try to uh, attract the, w the winter visitor. I'm going to transition real quickly to some data-driven studies. I'm not going to go into each study, but I want you to understand what they were, and then as follow-up, I can give you the link to the full study, because if I went through all three of these, Mr. Burton would kill me, because it would be like literally two hours. 
and it's really good data, but the purpose of this, and one of the things when I came on board, Mr. Burton said is, you know, how effective are we with what we're doing, whether it's the website, it's our advertising, and so uh, we have committed, we have, uh, the website ROI study we have done before, so that, that was there. But the brand perception study and the ad effectiveness study are two new things that, that we've done. Um, in fact, they have not been done previously. Brand perception is going through, and we interviewed over 4,000 travelers, and this was during the time period of August, September of 2021. We interviewed them, and it included past travelers and those that have not traveled to us, asking a number of different things, looking at our competitive set, but also going through and looking at how they see us around different perceptions around the, the brand and what you can do here. Um, and the, the great part about that is we got some insight. And, and how I can share that is by each market, so I can take Orlando, and Orlando is, comes up higher in certain things than Michigan does. Illinois comes up higher in certain things than Atlanta does. And so what it's going to allow us to do is have more targeted messaging. The other element to the brand perception study, which is more important to me, is it tells me where we're at. When it comes down to the messaging, when it comes down to the work that we're doing, are we on target? Uh, you know, and, and, and a great example would be when you think of a beach destination, who do you think of first? And you know, when you go through and they think of Miami and Myrtle Beach um, and Lauderdale, and we're like, I think we're fifth out of 10, that tells me, wait a minute, we need to do a better job of getting that message out. But we also learn, too, where we land when it comes down to, let's say, arts and culture, rich history. And, and so it now tells us what our op, you know, where we need to climb and what things we need to go through and do. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a road map. Fascinating stuff. I, you know, um, to have destination analysts go through and present that would be incredible. But again, it's very detailed. I'll send you the link to the document. And from there, um, if you've got you know, questions, uh, please let me know. The ad effectiveness study, um, again, is something we have not done. And what we're doing is we're doing two studies a year. So basically, when run, we run two campaigns, one in the what I'll call fall, winter, and then spring, summer. And what we're doing is we're running, we're running this study to look at those campaigns and how effective was the campaigns in moving to drive business. So bottom line is, is it working? And so we can then look at it and say, wait a minute, something did work, let's continue it, or it didn't work, we need to make some changes. So again, from this standpoint, um, it's another, another way to measure the effectiveness of what we're going through and, and doing. I also wanted to say that um, the brand, the website, and the ad effectiveness study, we are using destination analysts, so it's a third party. The ad agency, Miles Partnership, are not in, they're, not, they're not conducting this. So it's a third party going through and, and looking at uh, that work. And again, all of this goes back, to, and as I've said re repeatedly, we got to use our data to make the, the decisions how to most effectively do what we need to do to drive business and, and visitation here to um, uh, Pinellas County. I want to talk just briefly about unwind and, and be kind um, on, on this. So last year, we, for spring travel, we had a campaign called Rise to Shine. And it was really, we wanted the visitor to know that if you're going to be visiting here, here's what you need to be doing while you're visiting. You know, at the time, you know, think about it, we were still in the midst of COVID, vac vaccinations were just happening. Um, and, and so that campaign was to say, hey, make sure that you're, you're physically distancing, make sure that you're doing, you know, all these different things. And it was a way to tell the visitor, this is what we expect when you come to visit here, so that we didn't have the visuals that we had the previous year when, when COVID started. This year, what we looked at is, um, one, one of it was looking at the shortage that we had in the workforce that we would get that visitors would be uh, practice patience and really be kind to them. They're here to help you create memories and having a short fuse 
uh, with them isn't beneficial to you or them. Let's be kind in this process. Well, the other part that came out of this was the encourage preservation and sustainability of our environment. And again, this came out of part of it with the um, um, study that with the resident sentiment survey when, it, uh, when we looked at you know, tourism as a whole, but one of the things they felt was a perception that our visitors are causing litter. So now we want to have a message that goes out and says, this is how you vacation responsibly. And we went through and um, on that... We had three partnerships, one with Keep Pinellas Beautiful. Uh, the second is with the Hippo, which was um, Ice Pops. And then the third is a uh, social media influencer who has 1.4 million followers on TikTok, um, but is an eco-activist, is born and raised here, worked on the beach. And I, you know, he quoted you know, several times, is, has gone through and said, you know, when I worked on the beach and I would have someone visiting and they're like this is the best beach in the world I got to tell people about it they would leave and their trash would be sitting right there and he's like wait a minute that's not right so how do we educate how do we encourage our visitors to clean up after themselves and and be part of this uh, sustainability uh, um, thing what's interesting is when the staff originally presented uh, trash Colin which is his handle on TikTok I was like TikTok I had to call my kids to figure out what it was Um, because I it's not a realm I'm in. However, the following that he had was, has been incredible. And then in that partnership with Keep Pinellas Beautiful that does us you know, every single day uh, was incredible. And then the other part with the ice pops is we actually had them out at the beach cleanups that we did as the reward. So in other words, uh, hey, come help us clean the beach, and then we've got the ice pop. And then what was interesting on the beach cleanups that we had, um, it was people in the industry, people in the communities, but we also had visitors that actually showed up to go through this. And and there was one where they were staying down in St. Pete Beach, came up to Sand Key Beach to help with the cleanup because, you know, for them it was volunteerism while they were were on uh, uh, vacation. So results, and that's uh, through today, and I actually, this got updated yesterday. So the approximate amount of trash collected was a little less than 500 pounds, which doesn't sound a lot, especially when, uh, you know, Keep Pinellas Beautiful will go to Gandhi Beach and they'll pick up almost a ton on a weekend. Um, but this was, we were doing about an hour at each of the different beaches, plus we did Straub Park in downtown St. Pete. Um, and a lot of what we were picking up was smaller items. So cigarette butts, tra- you know, small bits of trash versus some of the, the heavier stuff. Um, but uh, we had over 400 volunteers that had signed up during this time period. Um, media placements, uh, 21, three radio interviews, over 80 million media impressions about this. And I think what, what was more important about it is a lot of thank yous from people for addressing it. And this is something that we're going to be working closer with, uh, Keep Pinellas Beautiful, to continue this. Because, you know, we think it's important for our visitors to be responsible. We need to help educate them on what that means. And, and again, that's everything from, you know, um, there was, you know, last year article in the paper about people digging holes and then leaving them. And that's a danger to our turtles when they come into nest. Um, But the trash and all of these other things is to basically keep that information out there um, to um, help educate the visitors. So... I ran a couple of minutes over, but I, I, ho- I just want to give a quick update, very quick update. Um, and if there's any questions, Mr. Burton. I- Commissioner Gerard, not really a question, but um, you don't really need to send us the whole study, uh, each of those studies. If you could just send us a summary yeah. of what you just said, because numbers go in one ear and out the other until I see them on paper. Okay, we will do. And I'd like to ditto that, if I may, because, again, we are partners with you, and a lot of this information, I had no idea, especially as the branding and the different campaigns that are going on, I would like to know more about that before they start happening, because we, as a group, interact with our our tourism and the folks here every day, and we can only be helpful to you as 
with as much information as we have, but if we don't have it, we're kind of operating in the dark. And secondly, <clears throat> because tourism is such a vital resource to us in Pinellas County in terms of our economy, I think that's even more reason why we need to have really good in-depth presentations periodically throughout the year and not just wait for one 10 or 15 minute you know, little slide presentation. I don't think that's nearly as much information as we need to make good decisions on behalf of you and all the folks who work so hard on your team. So anyone else have any quick Commissioner Flowers? Just, um, I don't know if you've considered um, adding your basket on beaches um, uh, to some of your cleanup activities. That's something that um, the administration did support. Um, and I know we've um, done that on beaches that the county operates, but you know, we didn't, don't have permission to do it on other beaches, but just another um, added tool for people to have something to put their trash in so it doesn't remain on the sand or go out into the water. So, yes, and then I do concur with just having that information. I know you and I have talked before about other entities who would also benefit from when we're doing an overall mass marketing blitz of Pinellas County and what's available when persons come here to um, vacation or staycation. <laughs> Commissioner Seal? I would like the link to all the studies because um, I'll take the time to try to read through some of them. And then um, you had started to reference the arts and culture and I think I missed that piece. So how do we as a brand or how is it our perception when you did that analysis? Uh, so on that, it, um, when you looked at it overall, we were in the middle of the pack. So still below a Miami, a Sarasota, um, Asheville, and I'm kind of going off the top of my head here. But for instance, in Atlanta, it was in the top three. Um, after, and for Atlanta, it was after beach and food. So then it was arts and culture. So for us, that identifies, well, wait a minute, maybe we need to do more in Atlanta or we need to do more in, let's say, Chicago because we were below that. So it, it really helps in understanding where we are and how much work we may have to do going forward. Commissioner, Commissioner Peters, do you have any concerns, questions, thoughts? Commissioner Eggers? All right, thank you so much, Mr. Hayes. It's nice to see you here. Thank you. Next up, Commissioners, uh, Barbara Sinclair is here to give you a quick update on Creative Pinellas. Right. And while she's coming up, you know, Steve's efforts to really use data. I mean, if you recall back some of our campaigns, we, we, we were throwing a lot out. We didn't necessarily have the metrics to determine if it was targeted dollars. And especially with digital advertising, they have so much more ability to, to really make sure we're, we're spending the dollars wise, as wisely as possible. And so um, we need to get you more. Um, we need to hear more, but I'm glad to see them moving in that direction. Good morning, right. commissioners um, and Mr. Burton administration. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. This is one of my favorite parts of my job. I love, I love telling you about Creative Pinellas. And this, is, uh, this presentation is called Level Next because as a, an, a young organization, still we are constantly growing and moving and shaking things up. So um, just a couple of highlights. I wanna talk to you about our arts navigator um, it's a tool that you use on your phone or on your desktop or your iPad. You take a little quiz. It tells you what kind of arts person you are. So the person who took this quiz came up as a creative explorer. And then it pitches to you some top things that you might enjoy in the arts in Pinellas County. Um, it is actually a comprehensive calendar of arts activities throughout the county. Uh, we were, I was listening to um, the pr presentation of the strategic plan at um, the TDC meeting yesterday, and one of the things that came up that everybody asked for was a comprehensive calendar. That's really difficult to do because you request all the arts organizations and the artists and the participants to enter their data. Um, this tool goes out to the internet and pulls the data in, so nobody has to enter it. We do. We do look at it and we craft it and we make sure it's accurate, but it collects it automatically. So this tool was meant to 
um, solve two problems. One is that there's so much to do in, in Pinellas County. How do you find and how do you decide what fits you? And then how do we comprehensively present all the data? Behind this is also our Arts Coast magazine, our Arts Coast studio, and our Arts Coast galleries, which electronically present the, a really comprehensive view of the arts in Pinellas County. In the packets that I dropped by your desks, there is a card where you can use that QR code and go up and test this out for yourself. Um, the reason it's that way rather than me showing you the QR code right now is it's so fun. I would lose your attention while you played with it. Um, we are doing a soft launch in June and we will be doing a full launch in November, right around the time of our Arts Annual, which is our big arts event that draws people regionally to see the best of the arts in Pinellas County. I want to talk to you now about our community impact. We have been having a, a sequence of conversations with the <coughs> arts community around individual topics uh, that uh, members of the arts community have come to us over time and said, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the performing arts. We need to talk about uh, how artists are supported and, and, how, and the well-being of artists. We need to talk about arts and tourism. So we've scheduled six conversations at the Creative Pinellas campus. We had three of them already. Our one last Thursday was um, with tourism. Steve Hayes brought in Melinda Horton from the Florida Association of Museums, and he brought in Stephanie from um, BVK. They gave a fabulous presentation about what's happening in, in the arts and arts and culture and really talked about how they are moving forward to help brand Pinellas County as an arts and cultural destination. And they took feedback from the arts community. Thank you so much. We had these great discussions after. And the arts community got to listen to their point of view and how they were approaching things. And we realized at the end of the conversation that that is the first time that we have brought the arts community and the tourism leadership together. Um, we were going to do that much earlier. And then, of course, COVID hit. But we are so thankful for that conversation. We've gotten tremendous feedback. And we will be having an advisory group come from that meeting, as we did for all of the meetings, to continue to talk about those topics. We're bringing everyone together in September for a large public meeting to really put everything in perspective that we learned. Um, we have recently partnered, as an example, we, we part, um, let me backtrack just for a minute. Partnerships are incredibly important to Creative Pinellas. That's how we make most of the good things happen. We partner with other experts or um, other facilities that have skill sets. So we recently partnered with American Stage for First Mondays. They come every first Monday of the month onto our Creative Pinellas campus and do a live performance. It's a reader's theater. We've had 30 or 40 people at every event. Um, and it's amazing because it is generally the audience is people who have never been to American stage production and have not been to Creative Pinellas before. So we're getting new audiences to see live theater. Another community activity we're involved in is the mural program. I think everyone is familiar with the mural program at Leelman. You can see, for instance, we took a really dingy warehouse and made it beautiful. Um, yesterday, we had a ribbon cutting out in, by um, a wall that the county has the right of way in front of Sutherland Elementary. It was painted by the, the kids, their elementary school kids, like first graders through fifth graders and the artist. And we had a ribbon cutting. Um, Commissioner Long was there and uh, was very wonderful to, to really talk about the impact of, of the murals. And the kids were there and their parents were there and the principal and the teacher were there. And it was so joyful to see what really can, what art can do for a community to energize. And the kids were so proud. They were dancing and oh, it was really wonderful. And the teachers and the principal were so thankful for this. It really brightens up the community. People were driving by, beeping their horns and raising, you know, thumbs up and clapping. It was very, it, it really reminds me of why I and many of us do what we do. Um, another community impact program is our summer camp program. Um, we've been doing it for four years. 
It's a really unique program. We have students, young people in Pinellas County or their families apply to Creative Pinellas for a grant to go to a session of summer camp. They tell us what summer camp they want to go to. The only condition in terms of the summer camp is that it's an arts summer camp. And the students are either in a Title I school or school lunch program. This year, we are approaching over 300 um, young people going to camp. We track this with a survey. We survey both the camp providers and the campers. And I was looking at that survey just the other day. And one of the questions to the campers are, well, now that you've done this, and, and I want to mention that about 60% of the students have never been to day camp before, and 80% of them say they've never really had an arts experience before. So we asked them, now that you've gone to this arts camp, what do you want to do? And the answers are things like, I want to go to a museum. I want to go see the Florida Orchestra. So we, we have other metrics, you know, we have uh, quantitative metrics too, but to me the qualitative metrics really get to the truth of the impact of this program. Um, I want to call attention to the NEA grant we received uh, at the beginning of this year. We received a $500,000 NEA grant. They allowed us 10% of that, so $50,000 for administration, and so $450,000 of that is dedicated to going out to the community. We were one of 26 local arts agency in the nation who received this grant of $500,000. Um, we have already determined and we are in the process of distributing the funds. Um, we have 350,000 going to arts and cultural organizations and I have some of them listed up here. The nice thing about it is it is arts and cultural organizations throughout the county. Um, we have, uh, for example, the Dunedin Film Festival, um, the Keep St. Pete Lit, Tampa Symphony, and then we have $95,000 that is being allocated to artists. Um, so $450,000 to give away. I do want to mention that we had probably over a million dollars in requests, and most of them were very, very good requests. Our panelists uh, were very joyous as we were to be able to distribute this money, and um, we're also, it was a very challenging thing to do because a lot of people who deserved it and needed it, um, we weren't able to fund. So we are really looking at how we can do more of this. Um, and we're sort of looking at this as a pilot program. Creative Pinellas learned a lot. Um, we're also really happy we're ahead of the curve in terms of getting this money out. We've gotten it out faster than most of our colleagues. Because um, you don't want to sit on money, you want to get it out to where it's going to do good. Um, just a quick reminder, we also have our emerging artist grants and our professional artist grants and our grants to muralists. And so we are getting funds out to, um, to artists and uh, people who support the arts in this community. Um, I want to close now with a little bit about Pinewood and the Gallery of Creative Pinellas. Um, and sort of really show you that it is now activated in ways that are uh, really, you know, sort of expanded geometrically. Um, we had the Pinellas African American Heritage Celebration, over 2,000 people, 500 visitors to the gallery. We had Youth Art Month with, in partnership with the Creative Pinellas Arts Alliance and um, Pinellas County Schools. We have our emerging artists exhibit up right now, and also an exhibit um, that is called The Things They Left Behind, where we invited community members who have lost somebody from COVID or during COVID to bring us something that either that, that loved one made or that was important to that loved one or that reminds them of that loved one. And um, we have curated it in the show, in the gallery, um, I know, Mr. Burton, you visited it for our opening reception. It is, we also partnered with Empath Health during that exhibit, and they had a table there. Um, and if people needed grief counseling, they could come up to that table and make appointments and find out what the resources for mental health were. So a really wonderful partnership. Um, that, both the emerging artists exhibit and the things they left behind are still open and in the packet that you have. Uh, there are our invitations. Also, um, I wanted to call attention to uh, and invite you all to our first third Saturday. We have partnered with the Florida Botanical Gardens and Heritage Village. 
on a first Saturday, excuse me, a third Saturday. This is our first one. We're, we're going to have it every month. We have three food trucks. We have special things happening at all of the facilities. And the thing about the, fir the third Saturday is it's mostly meant to help us with marketing, um, to give people a reason to come out to that park, and also to give the hotels. We have 6,000 hotel rooms within 10-minute drive of um, Pinewood, where the Gall Creative Vanillas Gallery is located. And we feel like it's going to be easy for the front desk person at the hotel to say, Oh, yeah, go to Third Saturday at Pinewood. So we're very excited about that. And then another thing we have instituted at Creative Pinellas is live tracking. Um, so we are tracking our visitors on a daily basis, and we are tracking where they come from. And as you can see by this map, we do draw about 60% of our visitors from Pinellas County, and they do come from all over Pinellas County. We have visitors from Safety Harbor and Dunedin and Tarpon, and visitors from St. Saint, Saint Pete and Gulfport. Um, and then about 40% of those visitors come from out of town. Um, we've looked at some statistics. Keeping in mind that the gallery was open only on Saturday and Sundays when we first opened, and we only opened the second half of 2018, and COVID came, 2020. We've had over 30,000 visitors to the gallery thus far, but we are on track to have at least 24,000 visitors to the gallery this year. So 24,000 annual visitors. Um, we have had we have had 310 professional artists involved with us at the gallery. We have had 500 student artists involved with us at the gallery. We have had 104 public events. And um, we really look at the gallery and Pinewood Park as a whole as being very supportive of what Visit St. Peter's, excuse me, what Visit St. Petersburg Clearwater is doing in terms of branding arts and culture. You can be at the beaches, you can be at Clearwater Beach or Indian Rocks Beach or Madeira Beach, and you can get to the gallery in about 10 to 12 minutes. And you can do that without a lot of traffic. You can enter the gallery for free. You can have that arts and cultural experience with ease. And so we see it as helping fulfill the branding that we are so happy that Visit St. Pete Clearwater is doing to really position Pinellas County as an arts and cultural destination. And we feel that Creative Pinellas is very much a part of that. Um, I'm really happy to take questions. And I also have Kimberly DeVito with me, who was instrumental in building the Arts Navigator. If you have any technical questions, like how do you make that magic happen, she can probably tell you. All right. What would you like to know? Anyone? Commissioner Edgars. Well, thank you for the presentation. I always love hearing from you and uh, what's going on in the county. And just um, just tip my hat off to you and your group uh, for the work that you do. Uh, just always have a. Um, visionary approach but also grounded in realism and uh, you're you know very communicative and I just really wanted to thank you for the extra effort that you've made in North County reaching out to folks on the mural program because I know we had some hiccups in the beginning but really I think it's just gotten better and better and I just wanted to tip my hat to you guys again and also the the idea of the metrics and and this new uh, device i'm looking forward to using it but uh, anyway great work great job and look forward oh, to, to hearing more anyone okay. else comments questions i would just like to say i think you found your niche and aligning with our tdc folks and go forth and continue to multiply <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you that's wonderful so I'm going to, before I step off, I'm going to ask a promise to really try the Arts Navigator. I think you will be so excited and so happy, and I think it's going to answer a lot of questions and fulfill a lot of needs. So, um, and I may reach out to you and say, well, did you try it yet? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And commissioners, uh, two things. One, you'll see more of Creative Panels' ideas as part of our budget process, so you hear a little bit more about that at your BIS meeting. Um, and also on June the 2nd, is going to be the Pinewood uh, Campus Master Plan. And so, so this is coming right on the heels of talking about the entire campus and the different uh, partners that are there and, and their future ideas. So, Very okay. good. So, commissioners, we're ready to go into our agenda briefing. Do you want to take a five-minute recess just 
really quickly, or no, you just want to continue? Okay, then go ahead and continue, Barry. Okay, uh, commissioners, um, first item 35 on the agenda is, um, and the reason I've popped up is uh, our supervisor of elections is here, and this is on the approving the adjustment of the precinct lines. Um, and so I'd ask Julie to come over today because she won't be able to be there on Tuesday. She sent you uh, a memo <laughs> to that effect. Um, and so asked her to be here today in case you had any questions. Um, Good morning, Madam Good morning, Supervisor. Everyone. Welcome. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. You too. It's my first time in this room with y'all. <laughs> All right, so yes, it's redistricting time again. And like with everything with elections, there's a story. And our redistricting story started just after the 2020, I'm sorry, 2020 election, general election. And we began what we call a, our point project. And this is like, this is not done across the state. This, we felt that this was a very important thing that we needed to do prior to redistricting. And um, the reason for it is because I want you to imagine these blocks, the entire state, er, state is made up of what they call census blocks, and so is Pinellas. So Pinellas is made up of census blocks, and within those census blocks are groups of people. How our system, our GIS system used to work, our mapping system, is that we would, people would be in what they call segments. So you have Main Street, and uh, I would live at 101, I'm sorry, I would live on a range within Main Street. So 101 to 110, these groups of voters live there. And then you go to 111 and so on and so forth. And that was called, um, that was a, that's kind of an old concept of how your mapping should be. And now we have what we call a point system. So instead of me living within a segment, I, we literally went through the entire county and every single resident voter is now a point. So you don't live within a segment, you live at 101 Main Street and you live at 102 Main Street. And what that does is it allows for a more integrity to our addressless maintenance process and it allows for us to better identify residential addresses, business addresses, so on and so forth, and make sure that voters, when they register to vote, we know where they are and we're good to go. And if there are things that need to be done, at least maintenance-wise, then we follow Florida statutes. That process took us a year, and I have to give huge kudos to our IT staff, uh, led by my uh, Chief Deputy Mark, and Nicole, who's our GIS specialist, Jacob, who's a GIS specialist, and then also I have to give some credit to our partners um, with the county, with Aegis, uh, which is the GIS group underneath um, BTS. But this was a, a, a huge project that took a lot of time, but Pinellas is better for it, and our transitioning into, we don't conduct, it's very confusing, we don't conduct redistricting we conduct the process of re-precincting. So what happens is, is that you have the Florida legislature who's responsible for doing congressional, state house, state senate, then they push all those maps down once they've been approved, whatever process that is, and then we get district lines from you all, and we get district lines from the school board through you all. And then we take those maps and we layer them on top of each other. And then we have to obviously keep stagnant municipal boundaries and special district boundaries. Those don't change. So you have all these lines on top of each other. And then what you have to do is you have to start saying, okay, where are our groups of voters who all match with the same districts? And so people who vote within a precinct, what a precinct is, is a group of voters who vote on the same congressional, state house, state senate, BCC, school board. What may split a precinct is because we can't change a municipal boundary and we can't change a special district boundary. What you are approving next week is proposed precinct boundaries, which are made up of all of these precincts throughout the county that now align with these new districts. So with that effort, again, 
takes time. And then, you know, we have to go, there's of course everything. You know, there was a wise man, I loved him, Judge um, Cadell, once said, an election is just an unfiled lawsuit. So with everything, there's a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> so we, of course, redistricting is in litigation. But the good news for Pinellas is that regardless of the maps that are currently being litigated right now, Pinellas congressional districts will not change. So what you're approving next week is our best move forward, because we do have to move forward. And of course, if something does come up and during litigation something changes within Pinellas County, we will have to then address potential um, amended versions of precincts and come back to you again. But if everything is the way it is right now, next week, upon your approval, of course, we get that approval, we will then go through the process of the big gulp where you have to take the current system shut it down and flip it and turn it back on and then everything it's kind of, you know it's like it's like a shuttle leaving the launch pad you know what i mean so now, then once it's back on then you have to run all of these reports you have to proof um, to make sure that people shifted the way they were supposed to and everything is where it's supposed to be and once all those checks and t's and i's have been dotted and all that stuff is good to go then we will move forward with mailing voter info cards um, there were, some, um, there were some key components to us conducting redistricting, I'm sorry, re-precincting. One which was, I think it's very important as an election administrator to do everything that you possibly can to have continuity, continuity from election to election. I mean, I obviously, the most constant in elections is change, but the point is, is that if we can do whatever we can to minimize change, that's a good thing for our voters because famili familiarity with a process is going to encourage voters to want to participate again. So with that bar being set on keeping things as, um, as normal as possible, so to speak, is some, my staff was able to, to keep 90% of our voters going to the same polling place, 90%. That is amazing. And when we had to make polling place changes is because we had to, we looked at how it could benefit the voter. There were changes when we were looking at the final map and we were going through our final look at how we wanted to do things. There were some changes that we made that we were like, that makes more sense for those folks to go here than go there. So when changes were made, they were because we had to, because the boundaries made us, or because it was to benefit voters. So the other is we maintain the same number of polling places. 51% uh, of our precincts had absolutely no boundary changes at all. And honestly, that's a testament also to some of the lines that we received. If they follow census blocks, if they follow um, natural <coughs> things that are in, in the county, for example, a river or a lake or a road, what have you, if those lines are followed, um, it makes it easier for us to build precincts around those. So the precinct boundaries, um, half of them didn't have to change at all. Same with numbering. It's something as simple as a number. We did everything we could to, as we all know, St. Pete's in the 100s and you work your way up to the 700s in Tarpon Springs. Why would you flip that on its head if you don't have to? So we did everything we could to keep the numbering the same. And we only needed to consolidate um, 15 precincts. And again, that was because um, either the, because of the new boundaries. Um, and also, we, we had in cases where we had zero voters based on last re, um, re-precincting, and we were able to then not have a precinct with zero voters in it because of uh, the boundary changes. And then in other cases, we in an effort to protect the secrecy of um, voters' ballots. If we had very small number of voters, we had some with a couple voters in them, um, or a handful of voters, if we can merge them in with another precinct that protects those voters' um, secrecy. And those of you who have served on the canvassing board, you realize how that is gets kind of complicated um, based on where we are in the election process. So 
kudos to staff for all of their effort in this process that has brought that we started back in December of 2020 to get to this point. And I hope um, that answers most of your questions. If not, I'm happy to to go through this pro go to answer any of them. Any qu Commissioner Flowers? Good morning. Thank you so much for that update um, because you know everybody's antsy mm -hmm. about what's going on and I know I have received questions about when am I gonna get my new voter mm -hmm. uh, registration card, voter ID card, so when I go to vote, I can show them that this is the right place where I'm voting for. Um, we probably will get a number of them returned for undeliverable mm -hmm. as addressed by mail. Mm -hmm. um, I think I know the process that maybe you all will follow, but um, you don't have to share it now, but if you're going to maybe give a report at our meeting, um, if someone can share what the process is so that persons know I'll, that. If address list maintenance, my, yeah, I can see Dustin right now at, at the office cringing because this is my favorite topic. I love <laughs> address list maintenance. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, it, and I, can be, I can go on for way longer than he wants. Um, but no, address list maintenance, no, but I'm glad you brought this up, Commissioner, because voter education is key. So these voter info cards that are being mailed, they're basically informational based only. I think it's very important that our voters realize that is not what we want you to bring to the polls with you. Right. If you choose to vote at, in, at an early voting site or at the polls on election day, please bring some form of ID that's acceptable. Obviously the top two is a driver's license or a Florida ID card. But that voter info card of course is important because it tells you where you're going to vote. But be, um, from county to county election, that's the polling place that you're gonna see on your voter info card. Mm -hmm. County, and then you go to a municipal election, that polling place may change because municipalities are responsible for their elections. They pick their polling places. Mm -hmm. The city of St. Pete, for example, uses the same precincts and polling places we do, but you could have the city of Seminole or the city of Largo that <laughs> you know, that consolidate in an order to, you know, save money. Um, and so poll voters, I encourage to go to votepinellas.gov to look up their precinct, on the precinct finder to find exactly where their polling place is for every single election. And it also will tell you who, you know, what um, district numbers, you know, what you're allowed to, what will be on your ballot, so on and so forth. And for voters who vote by mail, obviously you have to request one. And when we mail you that ballot, everything is on there and you get to vote what's on that ballot. Um, so thank you for that. And then addressless maintenance. So when we mail this voter information card, um, it is not for the purposes of list maintenance, like what we would do if we ran a national change of address run or if we did something to comply with statutes in regard to conducting annual list maintenance. That's over there. This is a mailing that we need to do because we have to conduct reprecincting. Mm -hmm. So when we mail these out, hopefully we don't get that many back. And believe it or not, it's shocking how many, you know, how, how these numbers are kept low because of the work that we do up front daily on addressless maintenance, which believe it or not, we do every day. And then there's requirements in statute to make sure that there's efforts done countywide, which we do, but it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger process than just this one time. It's before we mail ballots, it's before we, we'll, do, we'll run an NCOA before we mail these cards so that we can get those, that information back from the USPS before we do a huge large mailing to help reduce what comes back. But what will happen is if we get cards back, saying undeliverable, don't live here, whatever the case may be, then what we will do is that will start the process of us communicating with voters about where are you. And if a voter, for example, has a mail ballot request on file, um, we don't want to mail a ballot to an address we know from the voter info card, that voter doesn't live there anymore, so that request would come off. But the good news about addressless maintenance is that yes, it maintains the integrity of the process because we want to make sure your voters are voting where they live, but it's also not like, ah, for the voter because what it does is it puts you just in a bucket and once you contact us, 
to either request a mail ballot, you show up at the polls, or you show up at early voting, and you're like, okay, I'm here, and we confirm where you now live, you're good to go. We get you the ballot and you vote in the election. So I think that it's important, one, voters maintain your address, go on our website, update your info when that stuff changes. But if we have to find out through third party, meaning the USPS or some other means, we will make, you know, if you show up, if you contact us, you still can be a part of the process. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anybody? No? I have one. Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind. Can you, do you have, it may be too soon, I don't know, but can, you know, there's a lot of innuendo going on about how secure and how safe our elections are. And I, as you know, I think I speak for everyone here that we, un, we really understand how hard you all work to dot I's and cross T's and have lists to double check the checklist. I found that <laughs> hilarious. Um, but I've received a lot of questions and had a lengthy phone call this morning before I got here from someone who's really worried about this new election police force mm -hmm. that got put into place. Do you know how that will work? Are they going to have police different police and uniforms beyond our sheriff's department at all the polling places or at the supervisor's office? Do you know? So that is a component of the latest piece of legislation that came out from right. this recent session, um, Senate Bill 524. And from what I can see in the bill, it's a made up of a group, don't quote me, I'm not gonna quote numbers because I don't know off the top of my head, but it's a group that works with the Department of State. You have a group that's part of um, FDLE. And it's kind of from what was explained on the House and Senate floor, what was explained during committees. It's a, um, it's a task force that's under the Department of State where persons who have, and I'm quoting, personal knowledge of alleged voter fraud or election irregularities, which is what's in the statute, for them to go to report this. And my understanding, again, based on what was explained during session, is that that information then would be um, kind of, there's preliminary reviews, so on and so forth, to determine whether or not this is something that rises to a level of probable cause, what have you, and needs to be investigated or it's not. And so I can tell you that there will, from, from, from what will be from our office, there will not be law enforcement at polling places. Um, I know that, uh, that there can be times when things may arise where we may have to change our security procedures and go in a different direction depending on what may have happened or what could happen, what have you. So I'm not gonna completely carte blanche say no. But what I mean is, is that there's not, in my preparation or in my budget, anything to suggest that we're going to have law enforcement at any of our polling places. So that, it doesn't come down to that level. It's more of a place for people to do reporting of things that they believe happened and for investigation of that and possible then, you know, criminal action, I guess. Okay. Anyone else? No one? Thank you so much for all of your hard work and due diligence and making all of this so clear as mud. <laughs> as mud. <laughs> That's what we do. All right. Thank you very much for having me here today, and thank you for um, hopefully your support on Tuesday. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the regular agenda. Item one is Memorial Day Proclamation. Two is a Historic Preservation Month Proclamation. And three is a partner presentation with Tampa Bay Water. Um, we have uh, items clerk of the circuit court uh, recordings. We got reports received for filing. Um, Miscellaneous. Down under item 13 is an award of a bid. Um, this is for our job order contracting. We've had this in place for many years. Um, it enables us to pre-bid items and then put, quickly put them together with these pre-approved pre contractors. Um, you already have the pricing bid. As you can see, uh, the Small Business Enterprise 
um, goal for for these contracts are 15 percent um, so um, again this is updating that it's four million upset limit over that time period uh, 24 million overall item number 14 is declaring surplus uh, county equipment and vehicles 16 delegated um, items 16 is an annual up Commissioner Seal, on the delegated items, mm -hmm. I just opened that up. Um, the commercial insurance coverage renewal, which is item one. Yep. Um, are we going to stay with AG, AJG? Joe, you want to address that? Because if we change to the other carrier, it's um, almost a million dollars more. Yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. Now, remember, we got something saying that we had to increase the coverage on different buildings for. Hi, Commissioner. Joe Laurel with Administrative Services. Is that on the, the non procurement items? That is on the delegated log. Okay. Which is item 15. It says current budget for fiscal year 22 will be sufficient to cover all premiums if we remain insured with AJG. Boy, that's like a tongue twister. What um, is that? If the decision is to go through FM Global, the risk insurance, it will be over budget by 997323 yeah, first item. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. <clears throat> if you don't have an answer, no. No, I'll get back to you, Commissioner. Yeah. Okay. This is an item that I didn't see prior, but I'll okay. get back to you. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. Okay. Uh, item number 16, the annual update to the community rating system. This is for the outreach and public information component, which enables us to um, be able to apply for uh, grants and things like that. Well, um, Barry, I want to go back to the question Commissioner Seal just asked. Given that we are forced, for whatever reason, to go with a different carrier and that cost kicks in, yes. somebody will come back to us, right? Yes, Joe, Joe's going to get back to you on, on that today, but the and, and we'll be ready for that on Tuesday. We're, we're, there's no question we're seeing, you know, increases in this area. Well, um, I'm concerned about the projections of a 40% increase. In, in I'm sorry, commissioners, yeah. I didn't see this log, but I know what this item is after I read through it. The utilities department requested we change carriers because there is an advantage going with the with, with the other ca carrier from an engineering perspective and from a coverage perspective. So this gets charged back out through cost allocation, but that's why there's an additional fee. We're actually switching carriers because it is advantageous to do that. So we are switching carriers. Yes, yes. That's... Megan's, yes. Megan's on her way up to address that. I, remember, I do remember we got something by email, and I'm just trying yeah. to recall what it... Yeah, hi, Megan Ross, Utilities Director for Pinellas County. We had FM Global as a carrier for many years. They are a very reputable insurance carrier, specifically for industrial-type facilities and operations, uh, specifically our wastewater and water facilities, which are of critical importance. Obviously, if we have damage to those facilities due to flooding, wind, or fire, and uh, they... A couple years ago, there was a decision to move towards this um, Arthur J. Gallagher. It, it did provide a reduced cost, but on further review, the coverage was not the same and um, did leave us a little bit vulnerable in terms of that coverage for uh, specifically some of our facilities that are in flood-prone areas and lower-lying areas. So we wanted to make sure that while this does cost more, I think it is more consistent as from, from a resiliency perspective and, and ensuring that our critical equipment has the proper coverage and support of engineering services. I mean, you can imagine if we get hit by a catastrophic hurricane, specifically our South Cross Bayou facility is in a very low-lying area. And um, if any of that critical equipment ends up underwater and we can't provide sewer uh, services, to almost 300,000 people. We want engineering support to come in and to bring in generators, equipment, um, whatever we need to do to get that facility up and running again. So it is a higher cost, but the risk we felt was deserving of um, the services that we would be getting. Commissioner Seal. And how much of an increase in cost was it? 
I mean, this is a million dollars on, I mean, the, is it a 10% or? Yeah, it's, it's, the initial cost is what's on the sheet commission. I think it's 900,000 and change, right. what I recall, yes. But I mean, how, how much, much of an increase, increase is, is that? That is the actual increase. What, yeah. What's the Percentage. original contract? Oh, the original, I'd have to go back and check the yeah. exact number. I'm sorry, okay. but that is the, right, the increase. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you. Yep. I look forward to the information. Yeah, and you'll have that from uh, Tuesday. Okay, great. Thank you. Item number 17 is an award of bid to Witt O'Brien um, for our emergency rental assistance program. Um, we have had issues with trying to get vendors um, to properly oversee these, um, these different programs, and this is one, where we come to you and we hire Tetratech, and they've just simply failed to deliver, and so this would replace them with this company, um, and um, they've got, they do have experience, and staff feels good that they can actually complete it. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're not, you know, the, I think a lot of these companies are having the same issues everybody else is, they can't hire staff, um, you know, and so, but on this particular one for, for um, Tetra Tech, we were having to do most of the reviews because they were failing to catch problems um, as part of the review process. So we're asking for, to switch the companies to be able to complete this program. Commissioner Flowers. Um, thank you so much. First of all, I fully support this <laughs> because yeah. I'm sure we all get the emails. And then when I've reached out to staff, staff have been able to go in and really work things out. And, yeah. and sometimes it's things that it's like, oh, my God, that's all it took. So I am so glad that this is coming forth. Um, I'm really happy about that. So question. Um, and I can't remember, so I'm sorry. But in the contract, if they're not able to meet deliverables, do are they compensating us back anything? Because we do have some people who have actually gotten evicted, not because of their fault, because they didn't get things in, but because they got stuff in, but Tetra yeah. didn't do what they needed to do timely, and so the information didn't get back. So I didn't know if there was any clause where we could get anything back. They have caused great pain. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were touting themselves as this, you know, and we knew that there were very few companies. Things happen really quickly yep. with this money, and we were trying to get it out, but... You know, our own staff have been essentially doing the work, not essentially, have been doing the work. Um, so just ask her. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Bruce Bussey, Housing and Community Development. Um, with the Tetra Tech contract, there are some penalties in place that we've applied to the payments. Basically, there's threshold criteria that if they didn't meet, the payment would be reduced um, by percentages. And so every payment to date has incurred that penalty because they have not performed as as per the contract so they won't be receiving the full amount of the contract award because of their failures to meet some of the criteria um, but they will at this point have budgeted the full amount that they were contracted under we're closing that out we're transitioning um, Wood O'Brien's already stepped up taking over call center services um, we're doing training with them to try to make this as seamless as we can to continue the program and, and get to the finish line, which, which we're getting really close to that point. Right. And then my other question is, um, because there are probably some people in the pipeline for approval that are like at the critical point. I got two emails last evening. Um, one reached out to Congressman Chris office, not upset with us, just saying, hey, I've been working this and t tomorrow's it for me. So have you guys kind of gone through and looked at which ones are at that critical point where we're going to transition, but they, they technically shouldn't be starting to work until we approve them if we approve them on Tuesday. So are you guys kind of going through? Um, and if not, can you do that? Because, again, it's not the fault of the residents. Um, it's just, unfortunately, we have this hiccup in services. Right. Um, throughout the program, the prioritization has been for those that are facing evictions, and so they always get prioritized. Um, you know, Tetra Tech would prioritize those. We, um, our staff, our team that works on the program prioritize those. During this transition, we're continuing to prioritize those, working with our legal aid partners. Um, we've got a good relationship with three different agencies that are coordinating with us to make sure that those at the cuffs um, 
at risk of losing their housing are, are the top priorities. So our staff is stepping in during this transition, um, not only housing and community development staff, but we've hired temporary staff throughout this program to help us um, properly prioritize and, and expedite the program as, as well as we can. Thank you, appreciate it. Any, any more questions from my colleagues here? No? Well, I, ha I have a question, uh, Bruce. I don't know if you know the answer or maybe Barry, but um, it seems to me, I know we've talked about this a little bit, but gosh, I sure hope there's somebody at some level who's continuing to dialogue, discuss, and research what best practices might be in other areas for getting some kind of control over the, the enormous rising cost in rental um, units because I keep on hearing that in the middle of their, uh, you know how you sign a lease and it's supposed to be for a year? Well, in the middle or a few months into the lease, all of a sudden now they're getting notice that their rent is going up and they didn't plan for that. Not many people could, um, especially considering the amount that it's being increased. And surely we ought to be able to have some kind of a moratorium until we can come up with, with an answer. Um, about a month ago, we brought to you our um, kind of housing options. Right. I remember that. And, and one of it was kind of a, um, a um, tenant bill of rights, you know? Um, so I, I think staff is looking at that. We've certainly heard you. We're discussing it with the county attorney's office because as you know, um, there's only so much legally we can do. Um, we have already began the education process and pushing out that information and, and advising people what they can do. And we've certainly, through our various contracts, um, provided uh, additional resources to legal aid and others. Um, but um, but our, our options are limited. Um, and one of the biggest things is it, 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 you got people with a contract, but you got so many people that do not have a, an agreement. And, um, and so it's, that's where they're most at risk. And, um, you know, and they walk in and somebody says, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna jack up your rent or you're out. And, and, and there's just, there's very limited options that we have to, to intervene on that. Um, but the staff is looking at that. We're gonna bring back something to you. I know they heard you. You asked a lot of very good questions and, and we're, we're trying to figure out our, what options we can implement. Thank you. Well, thank you for continuing to work on it because I'm sure it weighs heavily on all of us that are getting these calls and frantic, you know, from people that are just desperate for yeah. some kind of relief. Just, real Commissioner just a real quick question. Uh, on this item, uh, people, <laughs> we can talk about it on Tuesday. Uh, just talk a little bit more about that, that credit that we might be getting from the, the business that's there. I just, it just seems we've, we've got a lot of money on the line um, for that program, and we're now bringing in somebody, I guess, almost to finish it up. Yeah. So I just would like to get a, see what that actual number is as we talk about this on Tuesday. Okay, and, and it wasn't specifically a credit or a payback. It was a reduction of payments to Tetra Tech. Um, basically, their, their contract was based on a percentage. Yeah, so we're dollars. not going to go back after money that they perform bad on. We're just not going to continue paying them. Well, the we're enforcing their... the penalty. So if they were due a thousand dollars, there's a penalty, and now they only get eight hundred dollars. Um, so they're getting less of payment based, right. on, and that was the contractual relationship. I understand. I get it. Thank you. Um, so if you're one, we'll have to pull this off of the consent for Tuesday. Um, item number eighteen is award of bid to Bayshore Construction. This is our annual boardwalk, fishing pier observation, and tower improvements. Um, for uh, $5.9 million. Works. I, item number 19 is award of bid to Black, uh, Backflow Apparatus and Valve Company and Test Gauge Inc. for Black Backflow Prevention Assembly Parts. Um, now, this is interesting because um, a portion of this uh, resulted in a tie. And so, um, <laughs> So on the bid, and so the chairman will need to um, draw from a sealed envelope um, the winner of this contract. And so Mary Celeste will be here to help us facilitate that um, and make sure our chairman <laughs> knows exactly how to do this. It doesn't occur very often, but that's our ordinance. <laughs> and so 
Um, I, the, uh, one portion of it will be awarded based upon its, uh, as it's outlined here, but the other will be done through that sealed bid process for uh, picking the winner of the tie. Ask the county attorney's office. Not that I'm aware of, but I can certainly take a look at it. But this is this is pretty similar to what you'd see in a, an election where there's a tie. It's basically drawing lots. Okay. Um, item 20 is a word of bid to TLC diversified for um, Cross Bayou digester gas equipment improvements, $822,000. And looking back, we shouldn't have put 19 on there. We're going to have to pull that off also because that's on that. In the <laughs> um, okay, 21, receipt and files. Uh, 22 is Housing Finance Authority. It's an annual report uh, from the Housing Trust Fund Program. On to the regular agenda. Item 23 is ranking of firms. Um, Mason Blue for this is, um, now we talked about the North County Service Center. So item 23 is um, design services for the North County Service Center for phase one, okay? Um, and 24 is the construction manager at risk um, for phase one for the North County Service Center. Okay, both are certified SBEs. Um, item 25 is award a bid to Oshkosh Airport Products for um, a aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicle, $783,000. Um, item number 26 is a grant um, application for federal assistance. This is um, for the airport, obviously, but this is for them to help um, begin their airport terminal expansion um, project. And as you can see through the federal funds, they get an amount of money based upon their, um, what did they call it? I guess the number of um, landings per year and uh, PIE emplanements. Um, and so that's how it's determined. And so they're gonna get money for several years coming out of that program. So Perry, did you just say that the vehicle was a hundred and something thousand? No, the firefighting vehicle is 783,000. 183. 783. Oh, 783. Well, that's a big difference. That's why. I, that's why I asked because yeah, I. Thought these I are these are very very big vehicles, <laughs> and uh, can spray water or whatever they spray a long way. <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you. Item 27 is a MSTU project funding agreement um, project funding request uh, for PAL. Um, and this is to complete uh, portable classrooms. They actually received a grant from Juvenile Welfare Board, but since that time, uh, prices have went up, and so <laughs> as a result, they're asking for a little over $18,000 to complete that project. Item number 28 is a data sharing agreement with Florida Department of Economic Opportunity and our own Economic Development Department, and establishes confidentiality guidelines. Item number 29 is a, a, a revision to the American Rescue Plan, the, the spending plan for 2022. Um, I'm gonna ask um, Chris to come up and just briefly cover this. Basically, it replaces three uh, uh, utility projects that either have an alternative funding source um, or they're non-compliant on contracts. One of the things we were doing, we put several of these items on there, but the contract wasn't originally bid with the federal language that it's not eligible. And, you know, and we have that down later in this agreement where we agreed to fund the CAD project from the sheriff, but the CAD project, he had originally bid that before uh, knowing where we were gonna fund it from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch, around, switch out some projects and pay, pay for those with ARPA, and then that frees up the dollars that we then can give to the sheriff to pay for the CAD project. So. Little, little movement around, but Chris, maybe you can cover some of the other ones. Yes, sir. Good morning, commissioners. Chris Rose, Office of Management and Budget. So uh, the administrator did outline the main points of what we've, we've done. The utilities, uh, we've already explained, but the total amount going to utilities is gonna go down from roughly 67 million to 57 million. Um, we have a couple of uh, public works projects that have gone up in price, just normal cost increases, normal for right now, I guess. 
um, but not scope increases, so we're, we're addressing that. Uh, as the administrator said, we have $9.3 million going to the CAD project for the sheriff, and we're, we're doing it in, in, in a way such that it still complies with ARPA. So it, it took a little work to get to that point, but we got there. And then the final is um, some funding of fire districts, some of the, the local fire districts out there, in particular Palm Harbor and Suncoast. So, What were those projects, the three so projects? The three projects, one is Fire Station 68 in Palm Harbor for $2.5 million. Uh, the second is Station 28 in Suncoast Construction. That's the one on the mainland. That is a total of a million. And I should say in that one in particular, we also have some supplemental penny money that we will be bringing to you as well, but it's not in this item. That will come at a later date. And then the final one is uh, a, a heavy vehicle. It's called Squad 65, also up in Palm Harbor. It's their TRT. It's kind of a heavy rescue. They do sort of the specialized rescues up in that area. So those are the, the changes that we have in front of you today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Seal. Um, I'm trying to, so on the ARPA revised plan, is that the what we should be looking at to see what the changes are? Yes, ma'am. Is it highlighted? I'm trying to tell. Um, how to tell the difference of what's been... No, what that is, is that's the plan as we are proposing it. There's, there's also, uh, should be an item in there, I don't have it open in front of me right now, that explains those differences. If it's not there, I can give you a, a summary that, that basically I just read off of. Yeah. No. I'll do that. Okay. I'd like I don't to see, see that summary, because I... Because I, yeah, I was looking well. to see if it was you know, highlighted which ones were different, new, whatever, something else that was deleted so that we could kind of, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll get you one. We'll say what, what it currently is and the next column what the revisions are. So you okay. can see that you can see a crosswalk between the, the previous plan and the current plan. Thank that you. Would, that would be good. Commissioner Agar. Yeah, I, I, thank you for mentioning that because I think that's really important. And I, some of this 189 million that I'm obviously is the total, we have looked at and given some direction on some of it. Correct. So, so I just, that's, again, that's not shown here what yeah, is. We're only looking at the revisions. Um, the, if you actually open up the plan, it, it talks about the uh, all 189 million. Yep, that's what um, I'm looking at. And um, so what we're, what we're discussing here is, is proposed revisions to that plan. Um, and so, but there are, there are many other pieces to it. Yeah, so there's revisions and there's some of this that we've approved and some of it we've not yet approved. Cor correct. Okay, I just wanna make sure because I, it, in my mind, I, I had somewhere around 60 million that we've actually kind of approved. Yes, sir, that's the amount we expect to spend in the current year. That's why we asked you to approve it back in January. Right. So these are revisions just to that portion right now. And I understand your question, Commissioner. We'll get a crosswalk for you. Can I, it's okay. Yeah. Better so you can track exactly yeah, yeah, what's exactly. occurring. That's yeah. Yes, it, it, I, we're, I just looked at. It. Yeah, I we're can't. tracking. We're tracking changes, but we're also tracking things that yeah. we've done and haven't done. And as we yes, said, sir. you know, we had a we had a one-year spending plan. We had a kind of a two-year projection, and we're digging into a lot of those projects now. Um, you know, we also have timelines for implementation. You know, some of the things that we wanted to do. You dig into it and you go, wait a minute, we'll never get it done within the timelines within the federal grant when you have right of way acquisition or things like that. And so we're having to make some, it has to be kind of a fluid document because we have to be able to get it done within the timelines within the plan. The frustrating thing about that is, is the last time we had a deadline, I remember it was like 1231, the end of the year, and we rushed to do things. And then we're told at the last <laughs> we get minute, extended, yes. oh, that deadline, forget <laughs> that deadline, doesn't matter. Yeah. And so I think what they're doing is, that, you know, sometimes we're not doing it as, I don't want to say ir as responsibly, because we are doing it responsibly, but we might be doing it a little differently had we had some ad additional time. So, well, yeah, I, yeah. I hear your concern. I think, you know, if you look at, if you look at some of the overall goals, um, some of the things that you know, we may substitute out and stuff, it, we're still kind of keeping the intent of what we originally proposed to you and where we're making the investments and stuff. Um, just like with the CAD, you know, we had to make a revision because of that, but the bottom line is we're still funding up the CAD, you know, and, um, and we had to switch some penny money and stuff around to be able to do that. But, um, you know, it's, that's what we're trying, trying to keep the intent of 
what you uh, originally approved as part of that. So, so, so roughly in the, on the penny side, over 10 years, we have about, you know, say, $900 million coming to the county so if all the numbers mm -hmm. that we project out. So I'm assuming a lot of these are freeing up, as we talked about, right? So Some of it is freeing up. Some of it is enhancements. So, for instance, if you looked at the, the, some of the programs that we're doing in, like, Ridgecrest, um, in, in that area, we had some penny money, uh, some penny projects in there, but now we're, we're actually connecting the community and we're creating trail systems that actually connects. We're doing, we're doing more because of this new money and it'll actually make the entire area better. Um, so, you know, and, and rather than just fixing sidewalks, now we're fixing all the sidewalk gaps to where, you know, um, any kid can, can, it's a safe routes to schools. We're, we're able to implement that. And we never had a funding source for that before. So some percentage of this then is going to be replacing so, penny, some some percent. some will be, yeah, I got you. Yeah, All right. correct. All right, thank any you. Other, any other questions, members? Um, so Chris, um, back to not to the labor because I know you're going to give us final numbers, but Palm Harbor was how much? So Palm Harbor Fire Station 68 was 2.5 million dollars from. ARPA and yes. Palm Harbor Squad 65 is 600,000 for that heavy rescue vehicle. Okay, and then Station 28. And Station 28 was 1 million from ARPA and then we will come back to you with some additional penny funding just sure. not in this item at this time. Uh, and, and that would be two it's 2 million that was originally in penny and so it's 2 million but that'll be a separate item that'll okay. be out of penny funds. Now is this to replace the aluminum shed out there that is Station 28 with a permanent building? Yes. Is that what that's for? Mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. I'd like to chat offline and discuss it if, we, if I may. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. And commissioners, to, to Commissioner Egger's point, the guidance continues to change from the federal government. The deadline has not. Okay, the deadline is still in place. All of the deadlines until it does change, but at the moment it is still solid. Um, but the guidance continues to and change that, on and us. And that date is what? What is that date so, that's not changing? Uh, we have to have it committed by the end of 2024 calendar, so December Com 31st. Committed. Right, and then spent by 26. Okay. What does committed mean? Under contract, essentially. We've actually argued what committed means to. Uh, obligated is technically the word that is used in the, okay. the federal statute. So. Contract with somebody yes, to sir. do the work. Yes, sir. But we're, we're watching the guidance change on even that as well. Because uh, you, I mean, the budget is a one year budget. So there are some aspects of that that we're having discussion with as well. And I would like to talk about 28. Yes, ma'am. Um, Really, let's bring Lourdes in on that discussion. It's not, this isn't a, a funding issue. It's a operational issue. And so, you bet. You know, so with, so we'll bring Lourdes in with Jim yeah, for that discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Item number 30 is a refunding for uh, some sewer um, revenue bonds. And um, so, actually, this, this would save us about um, $500,000 over the life of the bonds. And so this is a good uh, cost-effective um, refunding. Um, item number 31 is amendment number one to a project agreement. Uh, so this is for um, the Corps of Engineers, and you can see the projects on Sand Key, Treasure Island, Long Key. So this is a 50-year life um, plus a six-year extension for the Treasure Island. It's adjusted up for inflation. You can see the cost there, obviously. These are just projections as over that over that time period, um, but the money that would be needed would come out of TDC. Um, and we are looking at whether or not we need to revise the TV, TDC estimates for beach nourishment as a result of everything that we're seeing, especially the cost. Item number 32 is our appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board, and they're listed in your packet. And 33 is appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee. And we'll see it in your packet. Item number 34 is um, issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds. Um, this would be for 
a rental housing project, Oakhurst Terrace. Um, so you previously approved uh, the penny for affordable housing dollars in the amount of $6.7 million. And so you can see uh, this is 220 units of multi-family rental housing, and this would be the revenue bonds to support the, the project. Item number, let's see. Okay, so we talked about 35. Um, and then to Under item to number 36, uh, there is a confidential um, memorandum that each of you have already read and initialed. Uh, it was a little bit, probably about a week or so ago, so hopefully you remember the facts of that. If not, I would encourage you to contact me after this meeting. Um, I think what we'll probably do in the future is bring that memo, and rather than have you read it a week or two in advance, just bring it to this meeting so it's a little bit fresher in your mind. But each of you have had the opportunity to read this. Again, um, if you don't recall or just want to ask questions, I, I encourage you to contact me offline. Um, under item number 37, I have left at each of your places today two separate letters that relate to um, waivers of conflicts, again, relating to multiple representation of clients within the county attorney's office. Uh, as I stated to you previously, previously, when you took action to waive the conflict for Bryant Miller Olive, um, these conflicts are created by the charter, Pinellas County Charter, which does provide that the county attorney's office represents the county and all five of its constitutional officers, among other entities. Um, so what you have before you is a letter um, that was uh, entered, basically was a letter between the county attorney's office and Mr. Burke, our clerk, back from 2012 that is still applicable uh, to the proceeding that is going on today with the filing of the new lawsuit by Mr. Burke. I have also provided you um, the very recent letter that pertains to the conflict that we already spoke with you about regarding the supervisor. What I am going to ask you all to take action on on Tuesday, really in an abundance of caution for my staff, is to waive the conflicts in regard to my staff so that we can continue to provide the general day-to-day -day services for both the clerk and the supervisor. Um, we did have a follow-up conversation with Mr. Burke through his legal counsel in regard to this letter since it is 10 years old. Um, I will tell you that also to be abundantly cautious uh, we spoke with the Florida Bar, who does have an ethics hotline that you can call to make sure that we are navigating the rules regarding uh, professional conduct of lawyers um, to make sure that we are completely above board in regard to all of the representation. Um, uh, we, this is Everything that I'm telling you today is consistent with that conversation that Don Kroll had uh, with counsel for the bar. So again, these are two letters that I really, in an abundance of caution, want to ask you all to vote on Tuesday to you know, waive any sort of conflict there may be just to con so that the county attorney's office can continue providing those day-to-day -day routine legal support, you know, legal services and support for both the supervisor and the clerk. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Question, Commissioner so, so we're just reaffirming the current role that you have it, exactly. outside of any additional lawsuits that have been filed Recently. That is that is absolutely correct. And again, Commissioner Eggers, like I said, it, <coughs> this is currently in place. We just kind of felt like we wanted to at least bring it to your attention, make sure that everybody is perfectly aware that the representation that my office is providing to these two constitutional officers is for their routine and day-to-day -day activities, which both of those officers wish for us to continue doing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions, comments, thoughts? Anybody? No? Well, I have one, uh, Madam Attorney. Uh, between now and Tuesday, I don't know if it can be done this quickly or not. I would like to have or read the case that Mr. Burke has referenced with regard to another case in Florida where a clerk has had to repay personally of approximately $40,000 for expending what was determined to be a misuse of public funds. I've done a little bit of research to try and find it, and I do not find any such case in Florida. And so I just would like to know what it is that I am missing in that argument. Um, we can provide some information, uh, certainly. Um, I, too, was unable to find that case, so I reached out to counsel for Mr. Burke, and he provided me some information. 
Um, it's not a reported case is why I could not find it. Um, but I can certainly, I, I just got that information this morning so I can gather the relevant facts and information for all of you and pass it along. Thank you. Okay. Item 38 is a county administrator report and then we've got the county commission reports. Um, on to public hearings. We have a number of public hearings. Um, we have a TEFRA um, hearing for a $5 million um, um, rev and revenue bonds on behalf of this charter school. That's item 40. 41 is um, a change. If, um, this is the first public hearing, um, and this is for Innisbrook. And so what they're proposing is to um, change an area of, of what they currently have and shift it to a different area. Um, this is, you had 10 people attend the um, LPA hearing, one spoke in favor, nine in opposition. Um, and again, this is the first public hearing on that. The staff will go over that at the time. Um, item 42 is a request for a zoning change from residential agriculture to residential rural with a conditional overlay that would restrict the number of primary residents to two tw single family dwellings on approximately 2.12 acres. Uh, this is ju quasi judicial. Um, you can see that nine people spoke in opposition um, on January 13th. Um, the and we received a letter from Dunedin asking that we postpone this to where they would could reach out to the property owner. We contacted the property owner and they declined and they wished to move forward um, with us hearing this case. Um, so but you can, you know, staff has a kind of a nice write up here. You can see um, that they said during the process they would work with them on and the neighbors on any type of drainage issues, obviously, they still have to um, uh, comply with any of our standards regarding de detention and things like that. Um, uh, one of the other issues, and I think that's one of uh, Dunedin's issues, is that it would be on a septic system um, because these would be not available for public sewer. And Eden doesn't have the capability of doing it in this area, or they're refusing to annex to Dunedin? They met with Dunedin regarding annexation. I do not know, and Carol's certainly here. She can answer any questions, but I believe they met with Dunedin, and they decided that they wanted to develop in the unincorporated area, so obviously Dunedin, without annexation, would not, um, would not provide sewer access to their sewer. That's typically how that occurs <laughs> and I would I would and I read the letter and I have no doubt that that's how it occurred in this in this this is just a little little enclave the enclave surrounded by correct yeah. so it's not it would be the first property that does that gets their zoning that they would want and then annex so that with, could be with, and Dunedin yeah. is wanting to address that because if they get their zoning and we put and they and they develop them and they want to annex then the question is would Dunedin and let them annex based upon the approvals that had occurred through the county i don't know the answer to this but is that accurate carol <laughs> well can't they work that out well we again went back to the applicant based upon Dunedin's request and the it's the applicant's you know right to go forward and they declined to Asked for a, a postponement of this while they could meet with Dunedin. So we did try. Um, case number 40, her item number 43 is a request for a zoning change from R3 single family residential to general commercial. This is in Loman. Uh, this is a small lot. This is the only residential um, zone lot in the entire block. Um, it was unanimously recommended. No opposition uh, was received. Item 44 is an ordinance adopting the comprehensive plan, Plan Pinellas. This is the first public hearing, um, and the changes that are outlined uh, reflect the changes um, and guidance that you provided uh, when we discussed it previously and with staff met with you. Item 45 is an ordinance amending Appendix A of the 10-year water supply facilities. Uh, this is the second public hearing. You heard this before. 
Um, and this provides for, this is a requirement for us to um, pass this part of our regional water supply. And that's it. Um, so that, that concludes the agenda. The um, other two things I wanted to, you know, just comment if I could. Um, first, we, um, on June 19th, you've got um, the Pinewood Campus Master Plan, unincorporated county updates, and special district updates. Um, I will not be here for that meeting, um, and you will have um, uh, Lourdes um, here and, Del and, and uh, Jill will be here. Um, you also have, don't you have, isn't the um, animal, animal that's, that'll be on the agenda, correct? Yes, that'll be on the agenda. And then, so it'll be, <clears throat> this is for the, um, on the uh, restriction of pet stores. Okay, and so that's coming back and we've got the ordinance and um, so. So, so we're, 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 we're not really workshopping it. We're putting it as part of the agenda package review because it's coming for a vote yeah. on Tuesday. That's correct. So we put it on for the workshop, um, or it'll be part of the workshop because right. it'll be on your agenda. Right. And then if you choose to act, it'll be on the agenda okay. for so, the following Tuesday. Gotcha. So we could potentially, depending on how that conversation goes, not. You could adopt it, you could postpone it. Got it, okay. Just know. want to make so, I thought we weren't going to take this up till after the first of the year. Does no. something change? Um, I'm just. I, no, I thought we were going to take that up now. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So we had one-on-one. -on -one, uh, Lord Benedict, Assistant County Administrator. So we had one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with with all of you regarding this topic. Um, and it'll be um, part of the agenda briefing. It's not a standalone item. It's part of that briefing on June 2nd. And then it's on the agenda on June 7th. June 7th. Okay. Great. So I won't be watching that, so um, <laughs> have fun. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, They'll tape it and make sure that's okay. <laughs> gets back. Um, and but then the, the last thing I just wanted to address, as you're aware, we had an employee um, that was arrested yesterday, and the um, you know an employee is an individual employee. They took a bad path. Um, we were made aware of it about a month ago. When we were made aware, we immediately um, put the employee on leave and um, began an internal investigation, and also simultaneously turned it over to the sheriff's office. Um, for a criminal investigation because of the allegations um, that were made. Um, and so the employee was on leave. Um, as When we had enough evidence, we scheduled a hearing at, um, for them, a pre-termination hearing, of which time they resigned. Um, so that concluded, you know, the employment issue. Um, and then yesterday, the, or day before, uh, the sheriff um, gathered enough evidence to where they could criminally charge them. Um, you know, anytime you have a situation like that, it's unfortunate. It's an individual employee that chose a bad path and chose those bad actions. We certainly do look internally and you know, are there things that we can change uh, to make us aware. Um, it's very hard when you have one individual that reaches out to one company and they um, set up type of a side arrangement. But there are some procedures that we're looking at in terms of how do we keep people in an area or whether we rotate them and things like that. Um, and so we're certainly, um, you know, looking at anything that we can do um, uh, to, uh, you know, head off and be aware of anything that would occur. But that's all I have. So, so technically, it was a, it's a it's a former employee. It is a former that, employee that's, a, that's arrested. That's correct. Okay, just want to make sure, like, from the timing perspective. Yeah, it was a former employee. She had already resigned, but we had, we had scheduled a hearing, but it was just the temp, but. Um, she had already resigned um, rather than face the termination hearing. Okay. Questions? Anything? Okay. All right, then, I, for the good of the order, I appreciate everybody's patience today. Yes, ma'am. And sure. thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And, um, we'll <gasps> and we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>